34. I'm relieved when Ron's car isn't in the staff parking lot at school high school. If there's nothing to be found, I don't want him witnessing my disappointment and embarrassment. And if my hunch is correct, it means Uncle David wanted me to find it. After I read his research, I'll know whether he intended for me to share it with the FBI. Part of me wishes I could ask Jamie to come along. I want him to be with me, whether there is a hidden notebook or not. But if it's there, I will get enough for me and me alone to read it. The secretary makes me sign in, even though it's the end of the school day. As I do, she asks about Grand Mary and Mom. My grandmother is the same. Thank you for asking, Mrs. Hammond. A plausible lie comes to me down. But my mom has been having a hard time lately. She's still grieving. I wondered if I could go to Uncle David's house. We left some of his things there, framed posters and stuff. It might help her to have them now. The day I boxed up his belongings, I had an odd mix of feelings, devastating grief, surreal disbelief, a sliver of doubt as I replayed his inexplicably distracted behavior over the weeks and months prior to his disappearance. It was just enough to spark fury and then deep shame that I was angry at uncle for abandoning me to hold mom together without his help. Of course, dear, you go right ahead. I'll be here until five. I sprint to the science classroom. Breathless, I sit at the desk that looks like a gray military building. Mom was supposed to arrange for movers to haul it to the big house, but it was still in his classroom. Three drawers on the left side, two on the other. The bottom right drawer was where he kept snacks for me so I could power through hockey practice. Sometimes Levi would stop by after school to move snacks for himself and the guys. Uncle David never minded. He would say, plenty for all. That's why I keep the biggest drawer full. I remember the third day of Lily crossing over, the day for learning about new worlds, when Ron and his squeaky shoe brought me here. I pulled out the snack drawer, disappointed by the sight of file folders hiding the false metal bottom. Uncle David showed it to me only once. I was 10. He was so excited for his new job. The dissecting pits are across the classroom in the storage case next to the microscopes. He kept his more elaborate dissecting kit on the top shelf. I removed two identical tools from the zippered case. A mall probe and seeker is a six inch chrome rod with an angled tip on one end. It's like a dental pick, but less delicate. I extend the bottom drawer fully and kneel next to it to begin my task. The folders are filed alphabetically, so I make neat stacks on the floor in order. My fingers touch the barely visible holes in each corner of the metal bottom focusing on two corners diagonally across from each other. I slide the bent tips into the minuscule openings before straightening the tools. Heart pounding, I lift the probe's angled ends to hoist what resembles a metal lid covering a hidden bottom, two inches deep, and just a hair smaller than the width and length of the drawer. This could be it, the most important clue so far. I can't look, I have to, but what if? I look down to see an ordinary blue spiral notebook. There, it's right there. I knew it. Uncle David documented everything. I do know my metal. I set the metal lid against the wall. It promptly slides and clangs loudly. Donis, are you still here, dear? Mrs. Hammond calls down the hallway. Yup. I slide the notebook into the back of my jeans. Her footsteps approach as I quickly put the false bottom back into place and return the file folders. I nearly drop one step. I close the drawer three seconds before she reaches the doorway. It's enough time for me to spot the probes on the floor. I sit back against the wall and cover the tools with my leg. It's harder to be back here than I thought, I tell her. Channeling any bit of stealth, I scoop up the probes as I rise. Mrs. H takes a step closer and appears to try to comfort me. I hold up my left hand to keep her at bay. I'm fine, I say, sitting on the edge of the desk. I pretend to compose myself, which requires a stellar performance because I'm shaking for real. It's possible the secret that Uncle David took to his grave is in the notebook pressed against my sweaty back. My body provides cover to slide the probes into the dissecting kit and zip it shut. I glance around the room for anything that belonged to my uncle. I spy the shadow box with his collection of Lake Superior rocks and minerals. That was Uncle David's. 
I point to it before going over and carefully lifting it from its multiple picture hooks. This case and his dissecting kit on the desk are all that's left, well, besides his desk. Thank you so much, Mrs. Hammond. I know my mother would want to have these. I'll make sure she arranges to move the desk during Christmas break. And I'll tell my mother you said hello. She offers to carry the kit for me, and I let her. I'm riding a wave of secret squirrel satisfaction, fueled by jittery nerves and the secret tucked against my back. We walk to the Jeep. I thank her again while loading the two items. She reaches to hug me. I pretend to misunderstand her movement, quickly clasping her hands in mine, a gently squeeze and a gesture of appreciation as if words were me. Once your mother is feeling better, I hope you'll rethink staying home. I know Indian kids struggle in college because they're not prepared academically or socially, but Donis, you're not like them. Words truly do fail me. All I can do is gape at her in disbelief. Well, I don't mean anything bad about Indians, Mrs. Hammond looks around anxiously. You know I'm not prejudiced. As I attempt to put Mrs. Hammond's bigotry bingo out of my mind, I run through possible locations where I can read uncle's notebook undisturbed. Definitely not home, because mom will be there fixing dinner. Nothing on campus, because I know too many people. Same goes for coffee shops. Maybe the big house? Or what about everything? That's it. I'll sit with Grand Mary and tell the nurses I'm studying. I send identical texts to mom and Jamie. Me, studying for exam, shutting off phone, will be home late. Talk tomorrow. Walking down the hallway, I crack my back out of habit. The muscles in my neck and shoulders feel like the tar strings tightened one turn too many. I enter my grandmother's room to find mom crying in the recliner next to an empty bed. What happened? My mouth is the only part of me that can move. The rest is numb with icy fear. Mom looks up, surprised. Grand Mary's okay, she says, rising quickly. There's an issue with the plumbing. They needed to move some patients around. Right. I study her, and she doesn't avoid my eyes. Hers are puffy and bloodshot from crying. Her face is open, unguarded, framed. Did you have a rough day? I ask gently. No, sweetheart. I had a good day. Grand Mary, too. It just caught up with me. Next to the recliner, the blank notebook is on the bedside table. The closet is empty. She found it while moving things to the new room. I didn't mean to upset you with that, I say, collecting the notebook. When I shove it into the back of my jeans, I feel Uncle David's spiral notebook, Uncle David's secret. I know, she says. I really did have a good day. I ran into one of my students at the store. Such a happy little girl. Mom glows. Felt like a roller coaster when I looked through the notebook. She considers her words before asking. Do you ever have days where every different emotion seems to cling to you and it's just too much? As if to prove that I do indeed have those days, I smile and feel the pre-cry pinpricks in my nose. I'll leave the Jeep here and hop in your car. Let's rent a video and get takeout, I say, pleased when mom nods happily. The two notebooks at my back will need to wait because it's been one of those days. On Thursday, I finish my run, check on Grand Mary in her new room, and drive the Jeep home. My day includes the usual. Shower, class, Granny June, Ferry, Sugar Island, lunch, and listen to Granny June's tirade du jour. Today, she's met at the Elders Book Club members. They shot down her James A. Mishner book suggestion. But what got Granny even more riled up was seeing Nimki saying, if we read a story about Hawaii, I'd rather support native Hawaiian authors. As usual, Senia is spot on. I thought I'd be excited for my afternoon plans to pick up my outfit for Shagala and then go to the big house and read Uncle David's notebook. It's what I've been hoping for, information that might help the investigation, my uncle's last communication. Instead, I take the scenic route back to Granny June's house. I offer to run errands with her now. When she declines, I make my way to the dress room. Peddlers tries to rush me in and out, but I insist on letting others check out before me. All the while, the growing sense of dread builds until I find myself sitting in the deep with the engine shut off, parked in the garage at the big house. 
What if Uncle David's final thoughts revealed what happened to him? What if he was scared and hurt? What if his notebook raises more questions than it answers? What if? What if? What if? I shake my head. What if it helps someone? What if it could bring comfort to mom? I repeat those two what ifs as I make my way to the library and sit at Grandpa Lorenzo's desk in his leather chair. My entire body trembles. I stare at the blue notebook. Should I start at the last page? I run my hand across the back cover, tempted to jump into the deep end. No, I turn the notebook over to start where he started, in the before. I need to earn Uncle David's story. His first entry was on September 2nd, 2003, the first day of my senior year. My uncle wrote in English, mostly. Nearly every school day had an entry. He enjoyed jotting down the more intriguing questions asked to the students, leaving room for follow-up notes, which were often in a different color of the month. Instead of students' names, he mostly used initials and a class period. A few students were assigned a symbol instead. I picked out mine right away, a heart. When Uncle David spoke in code with mom about me, I was Macur, the French word for heart with the Anishinaabe Moen N in front to make it possessive, my heart. My uncle loved me and trusted that I would find the clues he left for me. When my nose stings and my throat tightens, I decide not to fight what my body wants to do. I reach for tissues and let myself feel however I feel. He included ideas we discussed for my senior year science fair project. I forgot about my plan to compare resting heart rates before and after smudging with sage and sweet grass. The goal was to identify whether there was a significant difference in Mishnabs who used traditional medicines compared with a control group of those who did not use the medicines. His side notes included reduced variables and Likert scale for cultural identity. We had a heated debate about trying to quantify cultural identity. I wasn't comfortable asking participants to assign a number value to something like, how niche are you? Uncle David challenged me to come up with a research question that might work with a Likert rating scale. I believe smudging, a cultural practice of burning and breathing in smoke with traditional medicines, such as mashka de wash, sage, and wingosh, sweetgrass, will improve my overall physical and mental well being. Strongly agree. Agree, neither agree nor disagree. Disagree, strongly disagree. In the end, I didn't do any project my senior year. I was eating, breathing, and dreaming hockey at that point. When Uncle David didn't question my decision to opt out, I thought something about his behavior was wrong. In October, Uncle David began writing more about one student in particular. Their symbol was a light bulb with a face including a full smile and a watermelon slice. The student, light bulb, asked many clever questions. Brian Cheneau was known to the entire school as someone who always asked questions, but his questions didn't always end with an actual question mark. They were more like stream of consciousness exercises or monologues with a lengthy buildup that ended with, isn't that so? which isn't an inquiry, but rather fishing for validation. Question, could Ryan Chanel be light bulb? Answer, no. Ryan Chanel fails to meet the threshold for clever. When it came to clever, Macy Manitou was all that, probably even more so than Levi. I remember how once Uncle David asked me what the difference was between cleverness and intelligence. I figured out that a person could be intelligent without being clever, not clever without also being intelligent. Cleverness also required a measure of shrewdness and creativity, neither of which were necessary to be intelligent. No doubt that Missy could could ask a clever question, a bold question, snarky if she wanted. But I've been in a few classes with her, and she never raised her hand. If called upon, she would give the correct answer. Macy plays offense everywhere except at the classroom. Question. Could Macy Manitou be a light bulb? Answer. No questions equals no light bulb. I think that is why he's asking endless questions. Even in middle school, he would jabber nonstop the entire time he walked over to the high school for chemistry. 
Sometimes he and Levi would get into deep discussions just with one or the other starting off with, riddle me this. Travis was in every AP class with me until he started skipping and then dropped out our last semester before graduation. Travis made classes fun. Even when Mike or Levi or any of my brother's friends were in an AP class with me, Travis was always the one I sat next to. He was intelligent as well as clever, and he asked smart questions. I can't imagine the brilliant and smiling light bulb as anyone but Travis Flint. A month later, around Thanksgiving break, Uncle David wrote down verbatim a question from light bulb. If a poisonous plant got tossed into compost, would it poison the whole batch of compost? Would it kill crops grown with the compost? Or could the crops survive the poison? If they did survive, would poison remain in their roots or leaves? I stretched my legs while mulling over what I'd read so far. Was light bulb's question actually about the origin of mess? I do a set of deep lunges from the library to the kitchen and return with a bottle of water from the refrigerator. Was that when it all started? With a precocious student's inquiry? When I was in reading the notebook, I sit on the edge of the seat and the legs bounce with jittery tension as the entry list fills the holiday break. In early December, Uncle David tried helping my mom develop a research methodology for testing plant toxicity and its spread into surrounding organic material. Light bulb became impatient. Instead of a carefully thought out plan to sequence steps, light bulb wanted to jump ahead. Soon after, the daily entries mentioning light bulb would cross out, and a comment added in the margin each time. No show. I recall multiple instances of Travis skipping class, only to show up the following day and ace an unannounced quiz. On December 8th, 2003, Uncle David wrote one word, champignons, the French word for mushrooms. Uncle David's entries from then on are in the code he and my mother invented. It takes longer to get through his notes because I need to translate. I'm used to hearing rather than seeing the hybrid of French, Italian, and quirky made up words. One of the next entries references canard isola. Canard is the French word for duck. Isola is the Italian word for island. Canar isola means duck island. He doesn't abbreviate it as di, instead he uses ci, which is confusing at first because I keep thinking it means confidential informant. It was in December that he must have picked up on Travis's increased drug use. He wrote in code about his growing concern that light bulb was messing around in things he shouldn't. That was around the time that I noticed Travis skipping school more and looking really out of it when he was in class. Lily and Travis began arguing, and not their normal cute spats, like whether Zamboni was a cooler name for a boy or a girl. Lily found out over winter break that Travis was cooking meth. She tried talking to Angie Flint about getting help for him. Lily fumed to me about moms who made excuses for their sons. It's so fucked up when a mom enables her boy instead of raising a man. I resume reading. In January, an entry mentions chill ege. I don't recognize it as any of mom's and David's nonsense words. I try enunciating different parts of the word. Like when Lily would say shag ala instead of sha gala. Chill ege. Chill eggy. She leggy. She leg. She legge. That's it. C-H-E-E -E is a phonetic way of spelling the Anishinaabe Moen word, chi, big. Legge is Italian for law, big law. Chi legge was David's word for the FBI. Chapter 39. Uncle David started working with the FBI in January. They told him about the hallucinogenic mushrooms in the mess that was showing up in different hockey towns and Indian reservations. Maybe that's when David realized that light bulb's research question about poisonous plants was actually about fungi. Spring had come early, and Uncle David could forage for mushrooms. He wrote an entry reminding himself to research growing seasons and made a plan to return each month. There might be new growths once it becomes warmer and the days were longer. Rain was another variable. A heavy rainfall might produce something that had not been around a month earlier. 
He began with land owned by Travis's family on Sugar Island. His entries became a log of his exploration of Duck Island. He foraged for mushrooms in cross sections, just like I do, except he started at the north end and worked his way south. He used orange biodegradable seedling pots to mark his boundaries instead of yarn. I smile. His lessons are part of me. I really am the best person to pick up the investigation where Uncle David left off. He documented each specimen of mushroom or fungi he came across in the unusually early spring. He left room in the margin to list its scientific name once he had identified it using his guidebooks. There were no blank margins. Every specimen had a name in the margin, with one exception. On April 4th, 2004, Uncle David found a variety of parasitic mushroom that wasn't listed in any guidebook or online directory. He drew a picture of the culprit. It looked similar to Astrophora parasitica. His notes indicated it grew on a documented variety of mushroom that was hallucinogenic. The parasitic mushroom was nourished by a decaying or composting hallucinogenic host and was likely hallucinogenic as well, an anglerfish of a mushroom. He added a row of alternating question marks and exclamation points, which was his signature indication of being excited about this unknown specimen. My own heart quickens at the possibility of discovering Uncle David's discovery. This could be a previously unknown hallucinogenic mushroom that might have been added to a batch of crystal meth, which found its way into the hands of a group of 13 kids on a reservation in northern Minnesota. I turn the page. My heart sinks as I read the results of Uncle David's analysis of the anglerfish mushroom. It did not share the same hallucinogenic qualities as its hallucinogenic host. He wrote, there is no connection between champignon and cativa medicina. He had given an Italian translation for men, calling it bad medicine. I think about what he just told me. The mushrooms are a dead end. Uncle David knew and withheld the information from the FBI. And he wanted me, and only me, to know both of these details. Uncle's last entry was April 9th, 2004, on Good Friday. He wanted to talk to Light Bulb's mother. He hid the notebook in the false bottom of his desk. My mother reported him missing two days later when he didn't show up for Easter Sunday dinner. I cry again. This time it feels as if my sorrow has settled in my lungs. Heavy, raspy, shallow breaths. I'm so sorry for pushing my grief away to make space for anger. I wish I could remember my last conversation with Uncle David beyond saying hello and helping myself to snacks from the desk drawer. If you knew it was the last time you were going to see someone, would you say something profound? Would you share how much they meant to you? Would you ask any burning questions? Would you ask for forgiveness? Would you thank them? The library is dark when I push away from the desk and go to the formal dining room. I sit in my usual seat and remember that last Easter Sunday dinner. Grand Mary at the head of the table, my mother next to me, Uncle David's seat empty. I blink away my tears until I hear him come into the house, apologizing to Grand Mary before he even sits down. Traffic was backed up on the International Bridge all the way into Canada. It's never taken over two hours to cross back into the US. He winks at me. Uncle David, I say across the table, Thank you for leaving the clues for me to find and for giving me the skills to decipher them. I'm so grateful for you. I drive to Jamie and Ron's rental house. Jamie answers the door. Ron grades papers at the kitchen table. Jag is on TV. Do you just want to go for a walk? I say. They do. We walk a few blocks away to Project Playground by the ball fields. It's one of those gigantic wooden structures like the one Art built for the twins. This one was built by community volunteers, with a tribe providing most of the materials. I need more information before deciding what to do with the notebook. Well, I finished my mushroom research project on Duck Island. My words in the cold night are visible puffs that dissipate after a few seconds, as if truly cloaked in secrecy. Their faces light up. I didn't find anything. I say quickly, but I was wondering when the FBI started working with Uncle David, like what month? I already know, but I need them to do most of the talking. January, Ron says, the kids in Minnesota got sick the last week in February. 
is the timing important? It could be. There are so many different varieties and growing seasons. It was a mild winter. Maybe it grew only then, during a fluke early spring. Unless we can replicate the conditions from February, we aren't collecting from the same sample Travis had. Ron's frustrated sigh lingers in the air. Okay, what other information can I mine from them? It might help if I knew more about what was in the file about the kids. Which community? And how are the kids doing now? Ron won't name the reservation and doesn't know how they're doing. I keep my face a smooth mask to hide my anger at being stonewalled. Jamie told me they hallucinated men coming after them in the woods. Did they mention any other detail about the hallucination? Was it visual only or did it involve other senses too? And maybe cross the senses? Doesn't that happen sometimes? I forget what it's called, but it's where people see music or taste colors. Talk less and listen more, I scold myself. Ron shrugs. It didn't make any sense. The kids were scared one minute and pleading for more meth a minute later. They told the ER staff that men came after them. Most of the kids wouldn't say anything else, especially after their parents arrived. Maybe that stuff happened, what you said about jumbled senses, because their vision was distorted. One boy mentioned that the men chasing them were small men, little people. The little people found the kids in the woods and scolded them. The FBI assumed whatever had been added to the meth X was a hallucinogenic mushroom because the Anishinaabe kids who tried that particular batch of meth saw something that didn't make sense. The team working the investigation was alarmed by the group aspect of the hallucination and thought it was an unusual side effect of an unknown variety of mushroom. Whatever was added to the batch of meth X, it didn't cause hallucinations because the little people are real. Travis said the little people were mad at him, but what if they were warning Travis, like they had with Leonard Manitou's cousin Skinny? What was so bad that the little people went after the kids in the woods to warn them? If the meth X additive wasn't a hallucinogenic mushroom, then what was it? I've got to go somewhere to think about what I still need to figure out. There are connections that I'm on the verge of making, but I need to go through the information again, uninterrupted and undistracted. Step one, don't show any reaction that might tip them off that you're on the verge of a eureka moment. Step two, think of an excuse to make an exit. Step three, go home and think. I sighed the way Ron did earlier. Well, what should I work on next? Because I'm all out of ideas. Ron starts to say something, but I keep talking. I know, I know, fruit of the poisonous tree. You're not supposed to direct me. I smile at Jamie leaning against the tube slide. He's letting Ron do the talking so far. But couldn't you be sneaky and drop a clue like, whatever you do, Donis, don't buy drugs from the boosters. I turn sharply to Ron. Wait, you did. Ron, in the car on the way to Marquette, you said, we can't tell you to search the hockey team's gear bags for disposable cell phones. I shake my head and give Ron a begrudging smile. I see what you did there. You're a clever one. We head back to their house. Ron says goodnight and goes inside. Jamie leaves me behind the Jeep. I put my arms around him, already hungry for his kisses. Instead, Jamie places one gentle kiss on my forehead, like my mother does. I pull back, puzzled. He leans in to kiss my cheek, except he doesn't. I see what you did there. You're the clever one, Jamie whispers in my ear. I drive away, mind racing. What did he mean? What does Jamie suspect I've done? Turning onto my street, I notice Auntie's vehicle in the driveway. Shit, I forgot I promised to come over tonight. It's 10 o'clock and I said I'd come over at eight. I park next to her. Before my hand touches the key in the ignition, she's already slamming her door and stomping around the front of the Jeep. Auntie, I begin, intending to explain my exhaustion. My sentence halts in my throat. My aunt has the same, do not fuck with me, look from the blanket party night. The only choice you got is whether your ass rides shotgun with me or in your own ride to the island, she says. But make no mistake, Donna's firekeeper, 
you are coming with me. Chapter 